everyone, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Elizabeth Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive. And for this very special episode, we have a very special guest. Alistair, say hi to everyone and tell us why you're here. Hi, everyone. I'm here mostly because I just love podcasting with these two fine ladies, but also <laughs> because I love Max. We're going to talk about Max. Max is getting a character Max. spotlight episode, and I'm so, so excited to talk about this amazing, mercurial, subtle, ambitious, beautifully defined, beautifully portrayed character. Max is what got me through the first season of Black Sails, the first time that I watched it. Oh, Max, wow. with honorable mention to Gates. I was going to say Gates for me. The dearly yeah. departed Gates. Max survives all the way to the end of the show, you guys, minor spoilers, and for me, <laughs> defines in a really interesting and subtle way the arc of the entire show. Max is pivotal to Black Sails while never really being the spotlight character, and I find that utterly beguiling. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. Well, this is, I guess, I maybe not surprising to anyone who's ever listened to Fathoms Deep. <laughs> This is my true episode of self-indulgence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting a really long time to talk about Max. Uh, Liz, yeah, we, you know, we're this, I think we've disagreed on things. We've agreed on things. The one thing we've mostly agreed on is she's the queen of NASA. I mean, you're the queen of yeah. NASA, but she's the queen of NASA. <laughs> That's right. Actually, Jessica Parker Kennedy herself told me that I could be queen of Nassau. <laughs> she so did. I win. Yay. <laughs> but you know, all this is built on sand. That's true. Yeah. When that foundation shifts, mm. then I guess Daphne gets to be queen of yeah. Nassau. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Pass along the crown. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be yeah. a bloodless coup. It'll be fine. I, I think we established a long time ago that if anything, I'm Flint. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I remember uh, watching Max all the way from the beginning. And even if I didn't agree with what she was doing, just finding her character so compelling um, mm -hmm. and loving to watch how her character arced and how she changed so much, how she uh, learned as she went through her experiences, which, of course, I think we so often contrasted that to Eleanor, who was in season four before she seemed to be changing or learning in the ways that we really wanted her to. Mm -hmm. um, and Max was just constantly growing and searching and changing and making the best of things and yeah that's where we got the whole shifting sands thing is from max so yep she's been an extraordinary character um yeah so that kind of goes to the first thing you might have already said your answer to my first question about max is oh i wanted each of us to say like what well, I wrote down the question as what do we love most about Max? But in parentheses, I wrote uh, what trait do we think most makes her the most perfect human in the black sales world? <laughs> oh, for anyone, I might have to say for anyone who who has found Fathoms Deep at this episode, um, let me just say up straight, like I am a super fan of Max and I know that not everyone is. And right. I don't know, either if you're not, either keep listening because maybe it'll be interesting for you or maybe maybe go to one of our other episodes if, <laughs> if Max isn't your thing because it's going to be like a giant Max love fest, at least right. from mm -hmm. this microphone. I think a little bit from all of them. Oh, yes. Um, but yeah, so so what what for each of you is the thing that kind of exemplifies Max's um, no, perfection? I'm just going to go. I'm going to stick with that. Uh, first of all, I'm going to say that I, I feel like most perfect human imperfection might be a little strong on my side of in, the Max in, gate. In, yeah, in Black Sails world. Even in Black Sails world. The most perfect by the standards of Black Sails is perhaps still not terribly perfect. Right. Well, that's certainly true. I just don't. I, I just don't know if I'm ready to commit to that kind of strong that's, language. Is all I'm saying. Fine. Maybe okay. at the end of the episode, I'll be there with you what, again. What do you like a whole lot about Max? Um, I love the way that she will use every tool at her disposal to get further to get out of the mire um and that as the show wears on although not always she does that with the most thoughtfulness and causing the least amount of harm mm -hmm. as possible i don't mm -hmm. think that's always been true of her but when she has caused harm she's been remorseful and she's tried to repair it so i think that that's i, I think of her in that um in, in the sale wrapped up in that tent um look at she's fastened it into like a dress it's mm -hmm. very little mermaid and <laughs> <laughs> and to me that kind of is the perfect example of what max does with her situation is she does make the best of it and is true to herself mm. 
For me, it's this fierce, razor sharp intellect. She's capable of deconstructing the elemental forces around any problem and resolving them to her advantage. And that is something that we celebrate in Black Sails. We're a mm-hmm. big fan of people who can work the angles. Rackham works the yeah. angles and Silver works the angles. And to a lesser extent, I think Flint tries to work the angles. Max is at least as good as any of those men. Right. And arguably better than all of them. Mm. Max is the one who drives every possible conflict, every possible scenario, and resolves it to her advantage. That takes a fierce and dizzying intellect that I respect right from the jump, right from the very beginning of the series. As that is mellowed and in some ways compromised by her her flourishing humanity in the back half of the series, we get a really interesting perspective on this elemental conflict between rationality and, and vulnerability which I think is one of the big conflicts at the heart of Black Sails, as mm-hmm. we've discussed previously. So for me, Max is Max is Black Sails the character, I think, more so than anyone else. She is the one who embodies the philosophy, the, the, yep. the pure heart of the show. Yes, I agree. I think that Max, and I, mean, I guess my all of my notes are an argument for this very thing. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I have said for a while that I have a central max theory I have mm-hmm. I have hinted at it and I think I said actually Alistair when you first came on with us that that a big part of it is that I see max as kind of a key to the worldview mm-hmm. of of black sales um I don't know if I'm really answering my own question here because I feel like this whole podcast will be the answer to my question <laughs> you know <laughs> I love what both of you said. I think that the thing I possibly like most about Max, especially after seeing season four, is her ability to learn Mm -hmm. and her Mm -hmm. ability to be introspective. And and also, I mean, I believe that Max has compassion from the beginning. I think that that Max's compassion is actually in evidence from the very beginning of it. Mm. Without, I mean, she does often sacrifice herself. Mm -hmm. For the sake of others, but she doesn't always do that, and I don't want her to. Sure, I don't want a character that will, you know, do self sacrifice and destroy themselves for the sake of others. Sure, I, that's not that's not my person. Um, yeah, okay. I want a Max. I want someone who is smart enough to see the solutions, um, mm. and within that, bring everyone along with her. And I think that is what most embodies Max. Should I start with my theory? I keep debating yes. whether to start with my theory or end with my theory. My I think theory. you should start with it. Okay, so I've hinted at parts of it. I think that um, I think that what's fa- has always been fascinating to me about Max is how much she parallels with, and I have said, especially in post season four episodes, um, mm. we talked a little with John about about this stuff. Was that Max? more than any other character in Black Sails, has parallels, very, very clear parallels with more char- other characters in Black Sails than mm. any other character. Like explicit ones where they use the same words, mm-hmm. where they've had the same experiences. Um, and I think that this is integral to her place in the world. I think that Max, I use the word key, if there was a map, I think that Max, I joked with John, about her being the protagonist. Again, I'm still not so good at defining protagonist. And I don't think that that's what I want to say about Max. I think in a way that she, almost like what you just said, Alistair, that she is the worldview of, of Black Sails in many yeah. ways. And especially, um, I wanted to bring up some stuff that, that Alistair, that you had brought up in our um, roundtable that made me think about it a little bit differently, that you really brought up this this divide between the historic characters and the Treasure Island characters. Mm-hmm. And I think that in a lot of ways, she's a bridge. She's a connecting point, even though the most fascinating thing is that the only Treasure Island character that she interacts with is Silver. Like she absolutely Uh, does not interact with Billy or with Flint at all during the four seasons. She and Flint look at each other in 406. Uh-huh. After the Spanish invasion, <laughs> I take such delight in your encyclopedic knowledge know. of the show, Daphne. That was remarkable. <laughs> and Billy talks about her like they have a conversation about her in four hundred three, or no, in four hundred four, where 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 you know where's Max? Oh, I have Max. Yeah. Neither of them ever interact directly with her. Only Silver, yeah. and even Silver, even though it feels, I mean, they started. That's how we started. That's how right. we learned. That's yes. how we met Max. Was yeah. in a scene. 
an infamous scene. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating to me. And, and, but so this led to a larger thing, I'm rambling a bit. Everyone will have to excuse me. I've just been working on this theory for so long. Mm. The two characters, and I, this I have said before, that I think she most directly parallels with, like Anne in a very specific moment when Anne's having her metamorphosis, they have mm-hmm. almost like an opposite, you know, basically in season two, Anne saves Max and then Max saves Anne. And then we learn afterwards that in a way they both were having a lot of the same things going on. But the two characters that she most explicitly is, is bound to through text, like through using mm-hmm. the same lines and techniques are silver and vain. Mm-hmm. So one is a historic character, one's a Treasure Island character. Hmm. The two characters who possibly are the farthest away from each other, personality-wise. Like, yeah. the Silver is almost 100% working angles, using strategies and things like that. And Vane is almost 100% about, basically, honesty and honor. Yeah. Interesting. I've been thinking about that in the weeks since the season, since the series finale, and thinking about the geometry of black cells, Mm -hmm. thinking about where those boundary conditions are. Right. And the more I think about silver on one end of the spectrum, vein on the other, and Rackham as the mediating point between, Mm. the more I get a sense of the shape of the entire story. But I think you're entirely right. Max also works beautifully alongside Jack. And I think that there's a beautiful kind of almost a symmetry, almost a reflective symmetry between Max and Jack, which is what makes their relationship so intoxicating. So for me, it really is Max even more so than Jack. Like I can Mm -hmm. see if you draw that line, especially because those are the two people that Jack has the closest relationships amongst Mm -hmm. pirates other than Anne. I mean, amongst male pirates. But Max is the one who's textually similar to them, like has Mm -hmm. actual parallels in her experiences because Mm -hmm. she and Vane both were born into slavery. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Silver, obviously, we don't know his backstory, but so it's like the the <laughs> techniques of Silver. I mean, that 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 parallel was drawn from almost the first moment because sure. the thing that both of them did first when we first met them was see the schedule, not know what it is, but know that it's valuable. Right. Sure. I, I think the most interesting division between Silver and Max right in that first episode is that Silver manipulates and and plots by virtue of his distance from others he keeps himself separate and max immediately integrates she's talking about partnership she's talking about alliance that is antithetical to silver's approach and taking that opposite approach i think really does in a curious way bond these characters more powerfully than you might expect well, and with Vane, there's also a similar thing that they have things in common, the background mm-hmm. and, and kind of the truth saying, although the difference is also interesting. Like in all of season one, Max and Vane, their biggest parallel in season one, their, their parallels about slavery and not mm-hmm. wanting other people to be enslaved come later. Their parallel in season one is really about Eleanor. They mm-hmm. both want Eleanor. Sure. And I think that Eleanor for them symbolizes on many levels the the world that they've been left out of. Mm-hmm. Because she is power that sure. just is in Vane's as in Vane's yeah. words, and the and the contrast between them is how they try to not get her necessarily because neither of them are really getting her, but how they try to outdo her. I mean, they're mm-hmm. like in in lieu of being able to have her, each of them is trying to raise themselves up in relation to her, mm-hmm. and it's the same thing. Vane does it by going to. I always. I always think of Lauren. I say this was going to the lumberjack island, and <laughs> <laughs> he uses his ability to inspire, to bring those pirates to Nassau to help him. Mm-hmm. And Max uses her ability to build coalitions. Like mm-hmm. by the end of season one, each of them has challenged Eleanor's power in their and using the tools that they're best at. But the mm-hmm. parallel is there, so that's mm-hmm. what makes it even more fascinating: is that they have this parallel. They're they're basically each of them their season one arc is kind of similar like they both have some amount of power in relation to Eleanor they're both brought low right Mm -hmm. and then each of them uses the tools they're best at to gain power by the end of season one and challenge Eleanor's status quo yeah but what I want to say about the whole thing of Max living between the between everyone I mean she again she parallels 
Silver and Vane, who are opposites. Mm-hmm. She parallels in season two, well, season two throughout, for the rest of it, she parallels Anne and Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolute opposites. The thing it always comes back to for me is drowning the cat. Mm-hmm. Is that is that thing that Marion Guthrie tells that story that's a story about a cat and her son and her mm-hmm. husband. And she does not mention herself in that story. Mm-hmm. She tells a story of a cycle basically between three characters that is a vicious cycle. And Max is the one who understands that the person who actually made the story move forward mm-hmm. was the person that nobody talked about. And mm-hmm. this is what's interesting when when we talk about Max, and, it, and you, Alistair, even said when we were in the roundtable that Max had been sidelined in season four. Mm-hmm. But had she? Max is actually the person no. who makes everything happen at the end of season four. It's all because of Max's doing. Every, the other people are doing the actions, that's interesting. But the, yeah, car- the person saying. who actually went into the woods and drowned the cat, the person who actually put all the pieces together that needed to happen for the resolution to happen is Max. Mm-hmm. So this is what I think is so fascinating about her. And Liz and I have always joked about Max being the one person who's watching the show. Right. Yes. And then John <laughs> said that also, that somebody needed yes. to, I think he used the words that she needed to step off the stage. Mm-hmm. That's and really so, interesting. Sure. So I think this is, it's like Max is not only the person who parallels, like who basically has the traits of the most characters mm-hmm. and is the person who integrates and learns the best. Like that's mm-hmm. her whole speech to Anne Bonnie right. at the end about Eleanor is that she, every person she interacts with, she learns from and mm-hmm. basically surpasses. And then even sometimes after that realizes she still has things to learn, but she does learn those things. This is what's so fascinating to me. Like mm-hmm. not, I mean, again, I'm talking more about Max, I guess, not the archetype, but the like Max, the role in the story. I don't know what I'm saying exactly, yeah. but but that she she is kind of the center point that's sometimes invisible, but everything is rotating around her and, and everything is rotating in relation to her because she yeah. she may not look like the person doing the action, but if you look at almost every part of the story she's kind of the person that's making it happen. Mm -hmm. She is, but she's doing so in a way that is somewhat oblique. It's very easy to watch Black Sails and come away with the idea that Max is inessential. It takes a very close textual reading to understand how significant she is at every turning point in this story. And I like very much the idea that Max is the key. She's clearly not the protagonist. She Mm -hmm. is not the person who is primarily driving the action or is defining the shape of the story, except to the degree that she... She reminds me of of this artistic concept of negative space. Yes, it is exactly. the absence exactly. of Max wow. that mm-hmm. kind of gives the story its shape in part. And it's only when you go through and I just glossed the Wikipedia page mm-hmm. uh, on mm-hmm. Max right before we sat down to start recording to just remind myself. Okay, so this is the vague shape of her story. Mm-hmm. And when you look at it, it is the story of Black Sails. Exactly, that is it. But sometimes she manages to exert that pressure by being all but invisible or exerting that pressure very quietly. I'm still not sure how I feel about the treatment of Max in season four. I think that the show's shift into a mythic tone Mm -hmm. does leave behind some of the more street level characters. But what's most fascinating about Max in the fourth season is the way that she continues to embody the street and the sea. She Mm -hmm. continues to be a bridge. This is why whenever I think of Max, I think of her on the bridge between the tavern and the brothel, because that is where she belongs right there. Those are the two worlds of which she is a part. I see Max as being the most powerful connective force between civilization as represented by the street and the frontier as represented by the sea. That is one of the things that Max can do that almost no one else can do is speak to both sides of that. Because we have characters who pretend that they can do that. Ultimately, Rackham is about the sea. He's mm-hmm. always going yes. to be. Oh, of course. Vane has no pretense that he is about the sea throughout. Eleanor is 
oh, she so wants to be about the sea, but she yeah. is about the street. She is bound by civilization from the very beginning, bound by the burden of her family name, bound by the burden of her relationship with her father. She wants to be the frontier, but can never be the frontier, which is why ultimately she falls in with Woods Rogers, who wants so desperately to be the street and will never be the street because he is the pirate king of Nassau. Mm, He's yeah. the one. And I see Max as mediating that distinction better than any other character in the show. Not the only character. I would argue that the combined gestalt entity of Featherdale manages to navigate that really yes. quite beautifully. They do. Yeah. And I think that there is something about Jack that allows him to stand closer to Max on that bridge than anyone else. But Max is the one who can make it work because she understands right. both sides. Right. Yeah, I think that Jack definitely tries to live in both worlds, but he he never could master the street. He, well, and fundamentally, I, he doesn't we, want to. Yeah, fundamentally, right. he wants to be a pirate legend. That's right. that's what drives oh, yeah. Rackham and he was is like the story. Super bad. He was so yeah. bad at it. Yes. But also brilliant. And I love him. <laughs> you all know how much I love Jack. I yeah. love oh, of Jack Rackham. But if you really go through every single one of Jack's successes, mm -hmm. every single one of them, Except for one. The one success that Jack did on his own was killing Linus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Right? So that, that was, was goes to our, you know, yes. our whole thing about, or, Jack, or Toby's backed whole thing about yeah. right, Jack, Jack backed in a corner. Every single thing he has even tried to do, including the pearls for the schedule, mm -hmm. from the first episode, everything that Jack has ever done strategically has actually come from Max. Mm -hmm. Wow. Gosh. Right. And he, as a character, <laughs> it seems like he kind of knows that and resents uh, oh, it, right? He totally yeah, knows it. Like he's, he super knows it. He's very aware of it. He never yep. quite says it aloud, but... Oh, certainly by the time we get into season two, he's well aware of that connection. And then by the yeah. time we hit season three, he's, he is resentful of that right. connection. Yes. Right. And, and in season degree... four, he finally learned how to be okay with it mm -hmm. and, and leverage together. it. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. what is most important to Jack Rackham, ultimately, is Jack Rackham. <laughs> we don't have to, when this is not the Jack Rackham episode. We don't have to go down that road, kids. We will have that conversation. to walk yeah. down over yeah. there. Yeah. Yes. We don't, this uh -huh. is the Max episode. Jack doesn't get okay. to take over. He likes to take over. He does. He's really he good sure at does. taking over. No, I, I like the idea we, that we can do the gonna... Max episode while primarily talking about Jack, but secretly Max is lurking in the background, defining the shape <laughs> of our conversation. <laughs> like he said... To Max, when he finally realized he needed to bring her to Grandma Guthrie, is that she would understand a woman who's quietly controlling the men around mm -hmm. her. There it mm -hmm. is. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. One could argue that Jack has two skills. Okay, three skills. Dressing well. <laughs> of course. Fighting oh, like a cornered Jack. beast. <laughs> Fighting like a cornered beast, sure. But the most important one is recognizing a good woman. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Okay, but that's enough about him. Love you, Jack. This is not your episode. Jack always Sorry, takes Toby. over. We're just we're just super <laughs> dazzled all the time, and this mm -hmm. is not your episode. Okay, so I wanted um, maybe, I'm sure more of my points. I have so much to say about her. Like, that was kind of my thing, but I mm -hmm. must always add in her compassion, which is beautiful. And this, so yeah, maybe I will, no, we'll leave this for the themes. Never mind. We're going to talk about her compassion in the themes. Okay. Okay. And her smarts. And her beauty and her wondrousness. But let's let's just quickly go through her season to season story. Just a little mm. max recap. I have titled the seasons. Um, so let's start with season one, which is Prostitute to Ma Madam, The mm. World of Shifting Sands. Uh-huh. Uh, I wanted to start this by reminding everyone a thing that I feel like people often forget when they're discussing Max because you see her become so powerful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is to remember... In this world where people, where we talk a whole lot about slavery mm -hmm. and a whole lot about people being persecuted, mm -hmm. Max is a person who was born into slavery and is also gay and a prostitute. Mm -hmm. She's just, she's actually yeah. the person of, of Black Sails characters when we first meet her. Yes. And then even more so soon after when, you know, she's taken by Bane's crew. Yes. She is actually the person with the least power in all of Nassau of the characters that we yeah. are intimate with. 
The deck is stacked against her, which is why yeah. I like her introduction so much, where she is prostitute number three of five. Right, I suppose, right. yes, in right. The exactly. Scene. Because we are carried into that scene through Silver's POV. This is yeah. his story as far as we're concerned. And that glimpse that we get of her looking at the the, the case mm -hmm. containing the pages yep. is so surprising the first time that you see it and then so compelling on every subsequent viewing. She is whip smart right out of the gate right. and a major contributor to what is effectively the first arc of Black Sails, the first story mm -hmm. arc. It is important to remember, I think, Daphne, as you say, that, that she has every disadvantage and yeah. no advantages, zero advantages besides a native intelligence. She is just incredibly smart, incredibly perceptive and willing to endanger herself in order to achieve her goals. Because when she has that first conversation with Silver, when she proposes this partnership, you have this incredibly valuable thing. You don't know who, who to sell it to. I want half. And Silver mm -hmm. laughs at her, which can't be the first time that a man has laughed at her. Yeah. She's willing to endanger herself because Silver is absolutely right. If, she, if he reports to Noonan that one of his whores is stealing from the customers, that's it for Max. But she is smart enough to walk this line. She is smart enough to mediate between these two impulses mm -hmm. and smart enough to put into play an alliance which could ultimately work to her huge advantage and, and arguably does work to her huge advantage. This, for me, was completely compelling. I was won over by Max immediately. I know that not everyone is, which is something that I find baffling. I get people who don't like Eleanor through the first right. season. I absolutely sure. mm -hmm. get that because I think her introduction is, is so problematic. I get people who don't like Silver, even, because I get that his introduction isn't necessarily completely easy and acceptable. But Max, for me, works so absolutely that I really don't understand the the criticism of her and certainly not i mean i know we're here to talk about max and not to talk about jessica but <laughs> i love the performance yeah. so much yeah I it's really so subtle do. yeah she's I agree. so so good and for her to go toe to toe in moments of enormous emotional intensity with toby schmitz with mm -hmm, luke arnold mm -hmm. of course these moments are so with with clara paget of course oh my they god they get so yeah. many moments in which almost nothing is said and it's all fantastic and with yeah. hannah which is preposterously subtle. I've gone back to watch that opening yeah. episode now so many times and every time I get more and more and more out of it. I, I love this performance. I love this character and she is right there from the jump. She is the inciting incident. It really yes. isn't Silver stealing the page. Oh, It's Max. Yep, yep. it's Max That's making really this coalition because yeah. Silver could have run around forever not knowing to do what to do with that thing. Or yeah. he could have left NASA. He could have yeah, gone right. to anywhere else yeah, and this absolutely. would not have well, been the story. Well, and he wanted to and I wanted to bring that up that this was the big difference between the two of them in this moment and this mm. is why, this is part of like one of my sub theories about Max that in a lot of ways she is NASA First of all, thematically, I wanted to bring up in my big rewatch after season after the finale, mm. um, I was fascinated how in the first two episodes, but especially episode two, how many of the lines that become iconic black sales lines mm -hmm. come out of Max's mouth. Oh wow! Now that's interesting. Okay, so I'll bring I'll I'll recite a few of them. But the big okay. thing is that's fascinating is that when they come up with this plan, I mean, the problem with the plan is that they get found out and Silver's like, hey, well, what's the big deal? We're just going to leave. But Max's plan was never to leave. Mm -hmm. Max's plan was to do this for herself and Eleanor. Mm -hmm. She That's what she thought she was doing. Yeah. And, and this is where, this is, I think, again, one of the things that people forget about Max, that it was, she was, she's not Silver. She never wanted to do this just for her own gain. Yeah. She wanted to free Eleanor. This, <laughs> um, it makes me sad still a little bit. It makes you sad that she wanted to free Eleanor or it makes you sad that Well, just that, that Eleanor... again, like that was, that was the one way in which Max wasn't at the very bottom of the barrel was her relationship with Eleanor because Eleanor was an actual person of power and prestige. Right. And then even that went away. And I mean, yep. her status was lowered even more then. And right. it just makes right. me sad. It goes Max, away personally. almost immediately, which I think is one of the problems with Max's depiction in the first season. I think one of the reasons that people might not connect with Max is mm -hmm. that the first time we meet her, she's manipulating the hell out of Silver. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then we get her and Eleanor. And I think the text itself cues us to believe that Max is super manipulative. I don't know that the text itself. Even with itself... Eleanor, you thought? See, I, this no, no, no. is where I, like, I don't that think seems so. the order of events. Me. Yeah. 
I don't think that that's the case. I, I was completely convinced by Max and Eleanor right from the jump. As I say, Max is what kept me invested, particularly right. in the Eleanor storyline through the first season. But I think that there is perhaps insufficient yeah. reason within the episode as it's presented to believe that Max is being sincere. No, and that's we certainly right. run into this problem with Anne much later, yeah. where Max actively is but she collapses to the ground. But she's an excellent actress. That's true. If yeah. we had seen right. that scene first, if we had Max and Eleanor first before the then... before the Max will comfort you, Max will Max yeah. is your yeah. Yes. Max is your safe harbor. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Right. If we had that first mm. and then we got her uh actually, if we had that first and and the breakup and then got the coalition with oh, Silver, wow. then we see her really scrapping and I think right. that I like that better. That's extremely good. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah see, I, I disagree because I need for I need for her goal with the thing with Silver to be to free Eleanor. So let me just let me mm-hmm. read some lines. Yeah. To y'all. Okay. Interesting. Sure. So this will do two things because you know I know that both of you know the lines. We all know certain <laughs> lines. Okay. So this is when the sand comes up first is in the second episode when she's mm-hmm. trying to convince like the thing has gone wrong. Now she knows she needs to leave because Silver basically because Flint was chasing Silver. Mm-hmm. So like Silver fucked up and put Max <laughs> in a position and he didn't understand that Max intended to stay mm-hmm. um, but I don't know why I'm defending Silver but you know I, I, I love <laughs> you Silver, Silver. Really doesn't need defending. I love you Silver but yeah not in this moment you really fucked things up for my girl Max um, mm. so she says to Eleanor this is when the sand comes up she says this place is just sand it cannot love you back mm-hmm. and then she says you know this you must know this this is one of the things that Flint says to Silver in the dragon speech. He says, you know this, you must oh. know this. This, You know this, you must know this. A variation on that is something that is scattered throughout all of Black Sails. We had say. characters say this yeah. to each okay. other over and over again. This was the first time. Interesting. Mm. All right. And then she says tells Eleanor like your your mother died your fa- your you know your father's has left you she mm-hmm. be- and then she says everyone has left you but I will never leave you mm-hmm. and again I think that the performance speaks to her meaning it like mm-hmm. there's yeah. no of there's course. being yeah. you know it's not like her in season in episode one where you could say okay maybe she's just a prostitute who's just like you know, lean on my shoulder because because sure. you're powerful and I have a shoulder, but mm-hmm. or other parts, <laughs> many other parts. Sure, sure. Sorry, that sounded like a euphemism for like our first view of the two of them, which is pretty awesome. Um, so, so she said, then, she, but this is where I mean, to me, I always read this as her really speaking to Eleanor. This is where we, I mean, we do find out in the beginning of episode two that she knows about Eleanor because she talks to her about her father she understands Mm -hmm. Eleanor's concern about NASA um, and she's a little baffled by it but again Eleanor expresses that she wants to make something of NASA and Max says I can do this for you I can offer you this thing Mm -hmm. I can offer you the means to have us be free but here she's asking her to leave so she says she says come with me we can be free of this place we can have a life which Mm -hmm. again this is a line that is scattered throughout is. season yeah. four. This is all anyone's talking about is mm. having a life. Eleanor mm. talks about having a life, asks yeah. Maddie if people can have a life. Mm-hmm. Silver talks about having a life again in the dragon speech, like mm-hmm. pretty much right. Max. The dragon speech is just is just covered. Well, not the dragon speech. The, that scene, the last sure, scene with sure. Silver and Flint in the woods is just covered with lines that happen to be coming out of Max's mouth first in episode wow. two. Wow. That's fascinating. So yeah, we can have a life and she says set us both free. Like mm-hmm. these and this is this is really interesting because both of them have been bound in their own ways by NASA. Yes. One of the most interesting things for me about Black Sails is the conflict over the narratives associated with NASA. We get right. all of these descriptions of, of who has the best vision for NASA, who has sure. a vision for NASA. And Max doesn't. She doesn't right at the beginning. She sees this as a place that is purgatorial. She wants to right. be oh. that the distinction in that life. We can be free of this place. We can have a life. Yep. In the script, that might be separated by a period, but really that should be separated by a semicolon because those two (laughs) thoughts are absolutely conjoined. We cannot have a life while we are here here because this is a place of sand and not a place of rock. 
Right. And that is fundamental. Max does not believe in NASA. Right. Until NASA becomes her, I don't know, this expansion of herself. By the time we begin season three and she is, you know, running the show, she's yeah. running the street. Her domain. Yeah. But she, even then she's aware that this is not actually a life. We get that brilliant bathtub mm-hmm. speech with mm-hmm. Anne where she's talking about everything being built on shifting sands mm-hmm. and yep. that anything, anything can take this away yep. from her. Yes. She does not have a narrative for NASA in the way that Flint and Eleanor and Mm -hmm. ultimately Silver and Billy and even, I guess, to a certain extent, Vane and certainly Woods Rogers have a narrative Mm -hmm. for NASA. Max is just not playing that game. She's not storytelling right now. Right. And that, again, brings us back to Drowning the Cat. Mm -hmm. Is that she doesn't ever really have a narrative for NASA and yet... She's the person who ends up solving yeah. the conundrum. She's the one who ends up breaking the cycle. Wow. And so how fascinating that in a story about storytellers and a story about storytellers where one person who's the best storyteller refuses to tell his backstory. What a mm-hmm. fascinating juxtaposition that Max tells her backstory mm-hmm. And there's another element with her in backstory is that I noticed recently, I pretty much can watch Max and Grandma Guthrie a million times over. Mm-hmm. I mean, Grandma Guthrie understands her backstory without Max telling it. Oh, like yeah. when Max talks about, you know, not about how she doesn't have unpaid laborers and tries to explain it, Grandma Guthrie understands immediately what she's really talking about. And then Max says words that could have come out of Vane's mouth. And you know that they could have come out of Vane's mouth because you see the way Jack reacts to them. Where Mm. she says, you know, I was bought and sold. And Mm -hmm. so I will never be a slave nor a slaveholder. The thing that's so interesting is that she tells Grandma Guthrie, like she clearly, you know, backstory has been acknowledged. And then Grandma Guthrie says to her, how does someone grow up? enslaved basically i don't have the exact words here and then end up here in my library in philadelphia trying wait let me find the i did write down part of it she said something like trying to change the world yes how did a slave get to my library in philadelphia trying to remake the world thank you and max's answer is what does it matter which is very silver that's interesting. Not really. That's what no. I'm saying is it's like it's almost very silver because silver is saying basically I refuse to tell I refuse to acknowledge this story and mm-hmm. what Max is saying is you know my story enough. It's because if if silver had yeah. said how did I get from whatever those horrors were to here mm-hmm. isn't something I need to tell you. That would that would be what Max is doing basically is modesty is a version of modesty. And it's something that Grandma Guthrie will understand. Like, we did shit. Interesting. You know, like, Grandma right. Guthrie brings oh. that up in the next episode. Like, I know you had to do some crazy shit to get here, and yeah. I'm, but you got to me. But Max is never denying the thing she came from. She's mm-hmm. just saying, I don't, need to, I don't need to be Jack. I don't need to mm-hmm. tell you the whole story of all the ways, all the things I did and the things I conquered and the ways I got here. She's not ashamed of those things. Max She's not- mediating between Silver and Jack. She's right. finding that middle ground. Ex- the she- broad strokes of the story are enough, but the specific details, those things which offer extenuating evidence, those things which justify and validate the decisions that have been made, she doesn't need to offer those. Right. The broad strokes are enough. She doesn't need to be Jack. She doesn't need to tell everything in exhaustive and theatrical detail in order to justify exactly. who she has become. Sure. That's right. fascinating. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so this is, I mean, again, I feel like anytime you take two characters, I I love Alistair that you said that, like, my sense always with Mac is if you take two characters that she has parallels with, which is pretty much everyone, Mm -hmm. pretty much, she will always be that middle ground. She will always find because she learns because she Mm -hmm. learns and she understands and she has introspection. This was I loved when Hannah talked about this. Yeah, she talked about the fact that Eleanor didn't have introspection, but Max Mm -hmm. does because she has introspection. I do think like I think that, you know, the like hidden character of Black Sails is introspection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Interesting. Okay, (laughs) And the characters who have introspection are by nature going to be more powerful. Mm -hmm. They may not seem the most powerful at the time, but ultimately the more introspective character is the one who actually gets shit done. 
I guess we're going to talk in due course about Max and Anne, one of the most important relationships in Black yeah. Sales. Max, Anne, and Jack all together, one of the right. most important relationships in Black mm-hmm. Sales. I suppose I would say that Max does possess a real awareness. She possesses a savoir-faire when it comes to dealing with these people. Mm-hmm. She doesn't always make the best choice. I mean, she doesn't always make the kindest, most human choice. Right. Her first interactions with Anne, her first meaningful interactions with Anne, are absolutely self-serving. That okay. is just about survival. Okay, let's move on to season two okay. then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I All want right. to stick with season one just a little oh, okay. longer because I need to talk about Max on the beach. I need to talk about Max yeah, as okay. not just a slave. I mean, by this point, she hasn't just, she wants to leave Nassau. That right. is her her explicit goal at this right. point. She's captured. She is taken. She is ruthlessly and systematically dehumanized. Yes. This makes it all but impossible for me to appreciate the dubious virtues of one Charles Vane for the rest mm-hmm. of the series. Mm-hmm. Because for all the talk that we get later about Vane's relationship with slavery. Sure. Yeah. He did this. Yeah. He allowed this. He allowed it for sure. And this is absolutely inhuman Mm -hmm. this is one of the i mean worst and and grossest abuses of authority that we see in a show that is frankly replete with gross abuses of authority that's one of the major themes of black sales what vane does to max is one of the worst things that i've ever seen on television what i would count here though is max's dignity Yes. Is her. And, and I'm very curious, actually, Elizabeth, when Daphne asked us right at the beginning of the podcast, what values we associate mm-hmm. with Max? What makes her the best human? I'm very surprised that you didn't say femininity. Oh. Because Max, unlike Anne, and unlike even to an extent Eleanor, who kind of circles back around in the fourth mm-hmm. season, Max never denies her femininity. She chooses to empower her own femininity. She wields being a yeah, woman. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta disagree with you there, really? Alistair. Well, just because I just, I see so many definitions of femininity. I don't, I don't see Max's version as true femininity versus anything <laughs> no, no, else. No. Certainly not from an objective perspective, but I would argue that Max perceives her own strengths as being uniquely feminine. This is not to say that that Anne is in any way meaningfully less feminine than Max. But I think that Anne would value her own femininity, her sense of her femininity, less than Max values her sense of her femininity. Eleanor is, I mean, how many lines do we get about too many men in this room? How many lines do we get about Eleanor's fate and life and story being defined by man? Max, to me, seems more inclusive and more more appreciative of her own femininity, not in a prescriptive, you know, this is what women must be way, but this is what I am as a woman way. Max seems to embody that more fully than any of the female characters that we get, except perhaps Grandma Guthrie, who also in her way embodies that that perfect unity of of, of introspection, I think, and, and awareness. Hmm. Uh yeah, see, I, I guess I do basically disagree with you about okay. Max and femininity and Grandma Guthrie. I mean, I think because they're both women who know how to work the angles, mm-hmm. you don't know that they that they are. You don't you don't know that they are expressing what their quote unquote true femininity is. You know that they're using the expectations of femininity to their right. advantage. With Grandma Guthrie, I think that's absolutely fair because we don't see her right. in her downtime, but we see Max vulnerable and we see her relaxing and we see her in positions of relative power and and relative disempowerment and i can see her being appreciative of her Mm. of her own virtue of her own sense of herself in a way that a lot of the other characters in black sales rail against themselves they are at war with themselves that's certainly true of a character like eleanor for example right. who's no, the most I, obvious point of I, comparison i agree with you about that about max and her personhood mm-hmm. um i think that her 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 expression of femininity is mm-hmm. is a version of theater I think oh, that's, I think that the, I see that is very much related huh. to pirate theater, but it's like Max's version. It's using the tools oh. that are in her toolbox. Um, wow. That's very interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yes. That's how yeah. I've always seen Max. Yeah, interesting. I think interesting. When I think about classical feminine virtue in black sails, I think of 
not even so much Miranda as Miranda's house. Yeah, I was thinking. Miranda. I was right. thinking like, like Miranda's house is kind of the idea of feminine right. virtue in black right. sales. Of- That's true. I mean, I think Miranda, Miranda for me is, I mean, again, I don't really, I mean, I've just come from, I guess, a slightly different perspective about mm-hmm. femininity in general. I just, uh, I really, sure. yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, this has always been a, you know, a neat thing between me and Liz and our conversations about this yeah. stuff. Like I just, I just don't really put a lot of, so it's this may not be a good topic for me because I just don't put a lot of value in quote unquote feminine virtue. <laughs> to be right. honest, no, no, yeah, no. well, it's such a no. cl- it's such and a classical term. It doesn't. Sure. I just happen to be a person who 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 really doesn't believe a whole lot in gender. And that's exactly what I mean when I say that that. Max's sense of femininity seems to me to not be prescriptive. She doesn't ever question Anne's self-identity or mm-hmm. Anne's self-actualization as nope. being anything less than utterly feminine. This is not prescriptive. It is descriptive. I see in her performance in particular that Max enjoys and celebrates her own femininity. Certainly yeah. in okay. the outfits that she wears when she is ascendant, in the outfits that she mm-hmm. wears when she is in power, when she is being respected, I see an excess of, of femininity see, as I Max see, would identify I that. I still thing. see that as theater. That's and so that, I think, is a really fascinating. I can't speak to that because yeah. I haven't thought about that at all. That's fascinating. Right. She's doing civilization theater. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Civilization theater. Oh, God. We never talked about that. But of course. She's wearing the most constraining and constructed mm. dresses of anyone, yeah. anywhere. There's nothing. She goes from flowy to completely yeah. structured. And for me, that is Max showing her authority. It is she, true that the two like characters uniform. in Black Sails who have the finest yep. grasp of costuming are Max and Drackham. Yeah. They are the ones who are most aware of, and oh no, right. this is an outfit that I am wearing right. rather than I'm just wearing yeah. these clothes. Exactly. I suppose Billy is the like antithesis of that. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Billy is the antithesis of that. Yeah. Um, and That's no, I think that what Max is doing with her clothing over the four seasons is so incredibly deliberate. And again, that makes so much I sense. I see it the That's same way that Grandma Guthrie would do is that yeah. these are yeah. women who understand people and understand power and understand what in power is allowed for a woman how a woman can Mm -hmm. can have power in a world that doesn't actually allow them that and it's like putting a uniform on every day isn't it exactly like putting a uniform i now want to have an entire conversation about this i want to talk about how each of the characters in black sales relates to their own outfits silver Uh is very self-aware flint is absolutely not Anne is very self-aware though purports to not be right well, oh, this for, is Anne, interesting. for Anne, I feel like it's more actually um, instinctive. It's not something she has decided on. It's not performative in the same way. I think that mm-hmm. Anne, Anne is expressing know. herself through her clothing without saying, I'm going to wear this to express this. That's my the feeling scene with Anne. Where Max returns, we're in the brothel, and Max mm-hmm. returns, having set Adele and Featherstone up. Max mm-hmm. returns to Jack and Anne and tells them, no, no, no. You've got a crew. You've right. got a ship. Congratulations, Captain. Anne sits down and takes off her yep. hat yep. and puts it on the table. Yep. And that, to me, if nothing else, suggests that Anne is very aware oh, of her see, outfit and her costume. See, I see that as Anne acting in a way. It's like Flint and his face twitching. It's something oh, that she's not oh controlling, but is it completely expressing <laughs> her state of being? That's so interesting. We talk so much about Anne and that hat. I remember. Yep. Oh, yeah. 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 In yep. Fathers, I yep. remember yeah. Fondly, well, yes. Right. And, and Max is and the one that she preserves wears it, when her she takes hat it off for and her. how much. Oh, interesting. Remember, Max puts yeah. after, after Anne killed Logan and Charlotte. It, yeah. Right. She's the one who saved the hat and put yeah. the hat oh. away. And it's something, one of the only things that, that John tweeted about in season four was asking people where that hat came from. <laughs> is Anne because she was she was back to wearing her original hat yeah, yeah. Wow. at the end yeah, of season no, four good. yeah she sure was come to think of it mm-hmm. yep Max is so, saving it for her in the first season and I guess we're going to shift gears here into like a more mythic kind of conversation in the first season Max is transformed from a prostitute who is as disempowered as anyone in Nassau. She has, as I said earlier, the deck is stacked against her. Every possible social and cultural disadvantage that she could have, she has. By the end of the season, she is in a very different place. Mm-hmm. But we can't ignore the fire that burns her in the middle of the season. Right. 
to what extent is Max's transformation out of that initial state into everything that follows thereafter defined by her experiences on the beach? And to what extent is her experience on the beach defined by her rescue? Oh, see, that's so interesting. Okay. You're, you two answer, and then I'm going to disagree with the whole premise of your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, do that first, because I don't think I understand the question. Uh, I don't think that that is actually the most important thing that happens to Max in season one. Interesting. I think okay. that everything that Max does is in relation to Eleanor, and that the moment that oh, God. sets- Oh, throughout all of season the, one? Yes. Oh, boy. The mo- you know how you know is that speech on that bridge, yeah. Alistair, that you just brought up, is yeah. that when Max oh, yeah. explains to Eleanor about shifting sands and about how Eleanor never would have paused on that bridge, but here we are talking, and about how saying, oh, I hear something good just happened to you. Hmm. We'll see how things turn out. Every single thing she did in season one, and even when she actually, when Eleanor tries to free her mm-hmm. from her situation on the beach, and she says, no, I owe you yeah. all a debt. I'm going back. Right. Everything she did was in relation to Eleanor. Every oh. single thing that has motivated, I believe, Max through up until season four was Eleanor. That's fascinating and I think completely completely right i think you're 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 very acute there daphne because this is another example of max embodying that negative space everything about the first season suggests that her being violently dehumanized on the beach that's going to be the crucible that transforms a character but not max not max and i was gonna say i'm trying to think if she in survived the future, that. if she mm. ever mentions the beach again nope. i think may Never again. Well, well it's once... constantly implicit in right. her relationship with Anne throughout. Right, exactly. It's with this Anne, debt because that Anne, is owed. right, and yeah. Anne's whole talk when Anne tells her backstory of mm-hmm. having had a husband who abused her and let right. his men all have sex yes. with her. That is the uh. bond that ties them. No, and she does bring it up to Adele. This is the thing. Mm-hmm. The thing, the okay. thing that's that sparks for me. That I think that her relationship with Adele was much closer from the very first moment because it was Adele who helped her get away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the thing that sparks for me what ends up happening in basically Adele's speech in in season four was Max saying, "When I was on that beach, she protected me, and no one else cared." Yeah, and, and she doesn't I say no one. She again. says, "She says no one, no one, no one." cared mm. yeah and she protected me so she will be protected and that's when she tells adele that none of the girls that adele will not talk to the men who could solve solve her problem right mm. right and that none of the girls will oppose this that max will protect Anne at all costs and this is why this is my argument against what i know you all are going to bring up about season mm-hmm. two <laughs> is that i believe that max needed to do what she did with Anne Mm -hmm. to solve her own problem because Anne said she's she's on her back or she's out of here again and Max definitely was not going to be on her back again Mm -hmm. but I believe that she had a loyalty to Anne from the start because Anne saved her just that kind of life debt so there are two basically there are two people who matter to Max Mm -hmm. there's Eleanor and there's Anne the listeners have no way of knowing this, but before we sat down to record this podcast, we were talking about Black Sails characters as Star Wars characters. We were. <laughs> we were. And now that you've called the life debt, Uh-oh. now I can only imagine Max as Han Solo yeah. and Anne as Chewie. <laughs> That's it right there. Yeah, it works. Totally works yeah. for me. Yep. <laughs> or vice versa, I guess Again, it would also work. Just so you all know, I had compared Max to R2-D2 because <laughs> she's the person who always knows the right thing to do, but nobody really listens to the her. The secret rational character. <laughs> yep. I like that. And we should thank our wonderful friend Carla on Twitter for pointing out that maybe, maybe Featherstone and Adele are right. R2-D2 and C-3PO. We, I think we also have to now credit Artie the Aqua Boy, <laughs> a.k.a. Larry Lucifer and Andrew Dice for being part of this conversation. We definitely should. It was a wonderful <laughs> conversation. Good times were had by all. <laughs> I don't know. I was asleep. This all happened. Like, <laughs> right. this all I just happened. woke up to it and said, right. what happened to this thread? I love those sleepy moments where you wake up and look at Twitter and just cannot parse what is going on. <laughs> but it's delightful. It um, is. So, okay. So, can we, so maybe now we... Oh, so what I wanted to finish my thought is that they're really, mm. for, for Max... Actually, there are three people who matter to Max. There, there's Eleanor, who I think is the, her, basically the motivating factor for Max throughout. Mm-hmm. The love of her life. There's Anne, 
the mm-hmm. other love of her life and the one who takes her out. I mean, that's the beautiful thing mm-hmm. is that what we see in season four is that is that Anne becomes the the shining star, basically, mm-hmm. for Max that takes her out of the place she always had been. And Adele, yeah. who's her dear friend, mm-hmm. loyal, that's loyal, really... loyal defender. God, I love you, Adele. Adele, Adele is so a goddess, great. absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting, Daphne, that you didn't mention Jack nope. in that. Nope. I think she loves See, Jack. I think she loves Jack, but he's not. If you, if I had to pick her three primary people, those three primary people would be Eleanor, Max, and Adele. Fascinating, I think that's fascinating because right. if I had to pick those three people, they would be uh, they would be Eleanor, Adele, and Anne and Jack. Well, sure. I'm not sure that that it is possible to distinguish between Anne and Jack in. In, in terms Ma- of their relationship with Max. I think there is. For Max, I think there is. For Max, there is. She takes such delight in Jack. And she does. it is I a delight like that she Jack never like takes her brother. from Bra- John- yes. Yes. Jack's like her brother. Yeah. yeah, Jack's like her brother who kind of drives her crazy, but yeah. that she loves. So there's nothing to the idea that the person with whom Max is primarily in love, that the actual love of Max's life is Jacan. That it's both no. of them in in unity. No, 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 no. It's Ellen, it's Eleanor and Anne. And again, this goes back to my thing about Max is that she's the way between. If you could pick, I mean, there aren't a lot of primary women in this show, but if you right. but if you look at Anne and you look at Eleanor, there could not be two people more different from each other. Sure, fundamentally so. Yeah. And yet, Max being this person who's the way between every two, every mm-hmm. dichotomy, basically every mm-hmm. dichotomy that's ever been created by Black Sales. Max is the person who finds the way between yeah. the two things. Well, and not just finds, but embodies. It right. It is but fundamentally embodies... at her core, well, the, the mediating force between those two. But she embodies them because she learns, because she mm-hmm. can learn. It's not that she's naturally in that place, I think. It's no, 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 because no, sure. It's because through introspection and learning mm-hmm. and wisdom, that's how she ends up there. She always finds the place between do we agree that Max is possessed of more introspective quality than any other character yes. in Black Sails? That she is the most self-aware yeah. character yeah. in yeah, Black Sails? Absolutely. Definitely true. The only rival that I would offer is Hal Gates, which it's no coincidence that uh, those are the two characters I, who got me through the first season. I love Gates, but I don't agree with you. I don't think that Gates has that level of introspection. Really? Yep. Interesting. Interesting. I would love to do a whole character spotlight on Gates, honestly. It would be a shorter episode, <laughs> yeah. necessarily, because yes. eight episodes is not that many episodes, right. this you This one's going to be but... super long, because we're still on season one, and I'm we sorry, haven't Daphne, even gotten to these. I keep interrupting you. Push on. <laughs> B.R. Flint, lead us forward. <laughs> All right. Season two, uh, which I titled Partnership and Coalition Building, right. with the question mark for you specifically, Alistair, is Max the Ethos. <laughs> I did make is this connection. Max the ethos. I did the whole thing. So for people who have not listened to all of our show, you'll have to go back to season two where I discuss yes. how James and Thomas and Miranda are logos, pathos, and ethos, and that Thomas yeah. is the ethos. I think and then I did. I started I think I kind of in a not so definitive way, but kind of suggested that that in fact Janex, which is also a thing from season two, everyone. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Um, that in, in Gen X, um, Jack is, is the logos Anna is the pathos and Max is the ethos and that she's the one who basically binds them together and moves them forward. Yes. I, I find that really interesting. This, uh, tripartite notion of, mm-hmm. of character dynamic is a really, really interesting one. And you can track it from the original Star Trek all the way through Harry Potter. It appears Everywhere, this idea that there is one character who is strictly logical and rational, one character who is emotional and possessed of of pity, and the mediating character who, by virtue of their protagonistic quality, drives the story forward. They are the hero of the piece and thus define the shape of the story. I think it is fascinating that you can, just by tilting your head slightly see this tripartite relationship in terms of Anne is definitely the pathos. She is mm-hmm. the the emotional, you know, Although I think nightmare. in season 4 she and Jack switch places. Oh, sure, certainly. But by, by the end of the by the end of the story, you're absolutely right, but in season 2, Anne is providing all of this emotional content, all of this emotional propulsive force, but it is very easy, I think, to switch out Max and Jack. Max is truly 
the ethos. She is the one, if you look at Black Sails as a whole, right. who's mm-hmm. defining the shape of the story. But as far as Jack is concerned, he is the ethos. Jack is, more so than any other character, the hero of his own story. That's true. He definitely well, does that's always. that's true. And yet, <laughs> let me remind you, Jack doesn't really get anything done without Max. No, you're it's absolutely true. right. This is it. From the perspective of Black Sails, the show, from the perspective of the viewer, we can see clearly. I mean, yeah. from, this Jack's, is one of the... from Jack's perspective, he's everything. That's right, true. That's, if you take every that's character similar. description from Jack's perspective, he's that guy. Like, but no, if you look me. at Harry Potter, there is never a moment when Ron thinks, maybe this story is called Ron Weasley and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> it's true. No, it isn't, Ron. You know that. But Jack... <laughs> He's convinced. He thinks, I mean, Jack is the Hermione Granger, I suppose, right. is what yes, we're saying here. Exactly. And he is convinced that this story is entitled Hermione Granger and the Gold of Lurka de Lima. Right. <laughs> but Max is the driving force and yep. the unifying force because that is the most important aspect of ethos as a kind of, as a, a philosophical archetype is that it unifies these two other forces which are themselves in opposition. And that is the story of Max. That is what she does better than any other character. And it doesn't matter whether it is Silver telling stories or much later Billy telling stories or Flint telling stories or even Jack telling stories. Max tells a better story than anyone. But it is a story that is anchored in the personal and in the human. She doesn't tell a story of Nassau. And when she does, it is fearful and depressing. I'm thinking of that scene in the bathtub at the beginning of season three, which is the, oh, everything seems to be going great and everything looks peachy. I'm in a bathtub full of milk. Seems pretty good right now. This is not going to last because these things are out of my right. control. Until we get to the drowning of the cat, which is sure. another story yeah. of NASA. She doesn't tell it. What she mm-hmm. does is decipher it properly. Yeah. And that's yeah. what Max does. Yeah. She listens she doesn't tell the story of NASA. Well, she learns. Right. That's but she the key. She listens. And this yeah. is a beautiful thing. She uses other people's words. She mm-hmm. uses their concepts. She is the person. They're all very busy telling the story of NASA or telling the story of themselves or telling all sorts of stories. All these men. So many men. <laughs> Too many fucking men. They're all telling stories. <laughs> And I, you know, I always think back to that scene where, where they're all, when the Spanish invasion happens and all these men are like, oh, we can't go get out of the fort. It will be dangerous. And Eleanor's out there, but what can we do? And she's just like, fuck y'all. Yeah. I'm going to save Eleanor. No. And that's the thing is that she's Uh. not busy telling stories of NASA. She's busy doing the fucking work. Yeah. (laughs) That's the difference. So what remains so okay, I guess we'll get to this in, in season four, because what remains so fascinating is that she still wants to be a part of whatever civil force it is that yeah. is framing the story. Okay. We'll talk this about is that in season three. One of the most three. baffling things right. <laughs> about Max's story. The most fascinating yes. thing about yes. Max's story is her relationship to her backstory and her relationship to civilization. <laughs> but we're not there yet. We're not. Season two, Daphne. Let's talk about let's talk about Max and Anne. Or Max and, you know, we'll talk about Gen X. Let's talk about Gen X, because that's really what season two is about in Max's story. Mm-hmm. Now, Elizabeth, you are somewhat more critical, I think, of Max's pragmatic decision to seduce Anne and remove this threat, as she says to Jack when they're out on the street. Right. Yesterday she was furious at me. Today mm-hmm. she's not. She was frustrated. Now she's not. I have eased her frustration. Do you believe this as a pragmatic approach? It's so hard. To, I, I need to sit down and watch this whole thing from start to finish again. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> Literally every time I have listened to an episode of Fathoms Deep, that has been my conclusion. Yes. yes. Oh, I need to go watch this entire show again. Exactly. I don't have time. There's so I'm much now at 65 there. rewatches of the entirety of Black Sails. <laughs> Everyone should just, yeah, just take my example. There is no such thing as too many rewatches. <laughs> right. There's something new every time. We just need a streaming channel that just shows Black Sails like, all the time. I'm an example. It's like I rewatch certain parts before this episode and I still learned new shit. Mm-hmm. So if That's I a- can still learn new stuff from the rewatch... How many times have you watched Black Sails in its entirety? Forget (laughs) dipping in and out of it. How many times have you watched it in its entirety? I'm fascinated by this. Like from beginning to end? I mean, that's hard because, no, because I've only watched beginning to end in the span of Fathoms Deep and then once after Fathoms Deep. I guess because season four hasn't been finished that long. Exactly. I rewatched, see, I don't know, honestly, Alistair. And, you know, and then there's like how many times I watched each episode before we did an episode of Fathoms Deep. Like Mm -hmm. three to six times every time. Yeah. I'm more like Then let me ask you this, Daphne. Which episode have you seen the most? 
Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer for that. There's not an immediate Our standout. Be because three, three. I feel um, that three, everyone, three, eight. yeah, everyone who has watched Outlander has watched 107 because oh. that is the we- uh, the wedding. Yeah, but Outlander more often than any other such episode. Such a different show. Sure. Oh no, it's no, such a different show. Um, I re I watched Black Sails seasons one through three at least four times through before we ever even talked about doing Fathoms Deep, wow. and probably wow. more than that. Yeah, this, like, my my ability to call up shit out of nowhere, it doesn't, you know, it's not... <laughs> people, yeah. I don't know, I, I talk about rewatching. so if anyone has the crazy idea that I do this because I'm really good at remembering yeah. stuff... I, say, I feel better now, because, that's right, because the whole thing with doing Fathoms Deep is that I was coming into it almost fresh. Right. Yeah. Well, we kept so, you fresh. You watched every episode like once before we right. talked about yeah, it. Yeah, I had seen season one through three, right? First. Right. Which yes. you binged also. Like but I binged through super it. binged right. those. And so like I watched weekend. I yeah, binged basically. I binged one and two because I started when they were in the middle of season two. Yeah. So and then season three I watched week to week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that so, makes me feel better for like these situations where we get into like the round tables or into this and there's all these callbacks. I'm right. like, I'm that's, super sweetie, fuzzy that's, on this. Why my, am I on this show? That's my job. Okay. No, I, I feel better. <laughs> before we ever, before I ever convinced you to watch Black Sails, yeah. I had already rewatched seasons one through three multiple times. Yeah. I was already, you okay. know, I was, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, yeah, this is, this is not, this comes from, this comes from yeah. a ardent slash embarrassing level of devotion <laughs> <laughs> well so to Not- go back to the question when max was there in the market with jack and she's telling him about how she seduced Anne and why mm-hmm. she seduced Anne, mm-hmm. and it was all just for her and and that she wants to get jack out of uh, there's a, a a scene just a little bit later where she's planning on getting jack completely out of the way can i just point out real quickly she never says this is all for me no, no, no. She no, no, okay. No. She doesn't quite. There say is that, an argument she, that this is for all three of them. Well, as she all right, but that's says not the in the first season making. or in the first oh, episode, see, I pleasure disagree. should be shared equally. It's the only way to avoid hurt feelings. Exactly. <laughs> no, I actually argue that she she never says it's all for for her, and she is in fact she's saying to Jack, "We had a problem, and I solved it, and you don't like how I solved it." I believe strongly that Max is solving a problem for all three of us, and that what she's doing is saying, guys. Y'all are being a little bit irrational here. And with her, like, get her out of here. Mm -hmm. She's betraying us. But, you know, subtext, I want to have sleep with you. Mm -hmm. And and Jack with your jealousy, because let me just remind you, you all don't have it. It's not just me who's the vulnerable one here. Like, we actually need each other. Mm. Like you. And this is where the coalition building comes in. Like, this is that she, you know, we're just a few episodes from jack getting beat up and pissed on right which i forgot that's the problem like i'm going back and watching all these clips but they're so out of context and sometimes out of order and it's been so long i mean literally a a year or more since i've seen these episodes so So, yeah yeah. so 201 is and they pissed on me Mm yeah (laughs) yep oh jack (laughs) so so yes it's very easy and i think a lot of people do see what max did there as just her again she she and she even says like i'm not oh she says this in season three when she's talking about what she's going to do she says i'm not i'm not going to pretend i'm not looking out for my own interest nor Mm -hmm. am i ashamed to say i'm doing that yes interesting but the beautiful thing about max is that she never she's no silver Mm -hmm. she's not trying to like make a pot of gold and get the hell out of there even silver i would argue it wasn't ever really trying to do that even though he thought he was Mm -hmm she's just basically being saying to Jack, like, hey, you're the logical one here. Mm -hmm. Let's be logical about Mm -hmm. this. I'm sorry that I'm hurting your feelings with my whole having sex with your with your sister slash girlfriend yeah. person (laughs) with with your twin person (laughs) with your whatever we're going to call it person. Yeah. Um, But, you know, basically like eyes on the prize here, dude. Mm hmm. Is there a sense in which Max is, we talked about this a little during the roundtable, I think, with Lauren and Andrew, the opposition, the dichotomy between a kind of rationalism in Black mm-hmm. Sails and a kind of idealism, and that we generally hold idealism to be the nobler virtue in Black Sails, even though the text itself is demonstrating, well, no, idealism is incredibly dangerous and will get you in trouble every right. single mm-hmm. time. Yep. Is there a degree to which Max's 
rationalism in this this entire sequence, this entire storyline kind of undercuts her virtue, undercuts her importance to the text. Are we supposed to see Max as a heroic character during the sequence? Or are we supposed to see her as someone who is slightly untrustworthy by virtue of her pragmatism? I feel like that's every character in Black Sails, though, right? <laughs> right. Well, I also think that you've just created an economy that doesn't exist. I don't think that, really? that, I don't think that pragmatism necessarily means untrustworthy. No, but I think that the way that the show frames idealism, it frames mm -hmm. heroic, oh, sure. reckless idealism, at least within sure. the pirate community, as something to which we ought to aspire. Mm -hmm. And I see that Max is kind of very ground level, her street level, if you mm -hmm. like, capital mm -hmm. S, street level yep. uh, pragmatism as being somewhat antithetical to that. And that, I think, is maybe one of the reasons why Max for some viewers, stands outside of the swashbuckling heroic pirate narrative that so many of the characters seem to be building toward. Right. Although the hilarious thing is that Anne actually is that person, too. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what's interesting about Anne is that she is the most piratey of pirates. And yet mm -hmm. she's always like, wait, weren't we leaving? Weren't we yeah. getting out of here? Yeah. Like she sure. never uses the word have a life. But that's basically but that's what, what Anne's saying. always saying. Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's go have a life. Well, this is another way in which Max mediates between extremes. She mediates mm -hmm. between Anne on the one side, who is ultimately pragmatic and doesn't give a damn right. about the story that is told, and Jack, who is anything but pragmatic. <laughs> Jack, who will go to extraordinary right. lengths to secure the the story, to secure his place in right. the legend. Max manages again to stand beautifully balanced between those two. Right. She's my girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and it's so interesting for me personally, because, you know, you all know how moved I am by Flint. Like, I want yes. Flint more than anything to actually never give up his his idealism. Like, right. he mm -hmm. finally reached the greatest version of his idealistic self at the very end. Yeah. And mm. I never want him to give up that because right. it's so beautiful. And yet Max is my girl. I mean, that's what's so for me. I mean, I feel like this is this is actually the essence of what's so beautiful about this show is mm -hmm. that you can be a me whose two favorite people in the whole world are Flint and his crazy idealism and Max and her absolute pragmatism. Yeah. But she's not not an idealist. I mean, that's the other thing no, is that no. she's not she's not she's not that person who like will sacrifice all for pragmatism. And that's part of why I find her so fascinating because I don't know if I've ever seen a character that is that pragmatic, that mm -hmm. is that, you know, seeing all the angles and all of that. And yet yeah. at the same time, so moral. I mean, yeah. this is, I mean, this maybe, empathy. maybe it's time to talk about that thing. I guess I was going to talk about the scene four, but John's quote has stuck with me our interview with him after mm -hmm. season four, where he said she's the only character who refused to allow violence to answer an unsolvable problem. Mm -hmm. Now, again, Interesting. Yeah. She, violence has been part of things that other people have done around her. There's no one in this world who's lived completely outside of violence. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. This is a right. violent world. But I love the way he worded that because that relates to like what we always ta talked about in... 403 when we talked about Woods Rogers killing Teach mm -hmm. was yes. that basically part of the worldview of black sales is that violence becomes the answer to a problem when you when you've run out of good ideas. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah, sure. And Max never runs out of good ideas, basically. She <laughs> never runs out of good ideas. Yeah. And so it's so fascinating because I feel like, yes, pragmatism is not heroic, but not completely not heroic. Yeah, I was gonna mm -hmm. say I think it can be. Right. Not heroic in the like grand gesture, mm -hmm. you know, operatic heroism, you know, that thing, that thing that, you know, you all both sure. know I do adore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like the small quiet again, like quiet yeah. power. It's the quiet heroism. And yeah. that's what Max represents, which to me, I feel like the show is making a very strong argument for that. Yeah. Pragmatism is not theatrical. It is no. oftentimes counter theatrical. Yes. Mm -hmm. And making the very quiet choice to do the pragmatic thing. I think that is where Max lives. I think that is that is the, the kingdom over which she holds absolute authority, mm -hmm. particularly when we look at her in the context of the other characters in Black Sales. That is one of the connections that I would draw between Max and Gates. I think that this ability mm -hmm. to do the pragmatic thing and to be 
I suppose, respectful of stories without being disengaged from stories. She's mm-hmm. not under the sway of narrative the way that Jack is, and she's not completely disengaged from the power of narrative the way that Anne is. She understands stories and wields them, but doesn't necessarily feel as though they apply to her utterly or define her utterly. The last thing I wanted to say about season two, which is really interested in relation to season one and reuse of phrases, Mm -hmm. is that is that in season one, in episode two, in the scene with Eleanor, where she's trying to convince Eleanor to leave, she says we can have a life. And what she means is leaving Nassau. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when after Anne has killed uh, Charlotte and Logan and Max stands up for her and says, I will not let them. I mean, I just, yeah, sorry. It's hard for me not to reiterate like the words Max uses Mm -hmm. to say to Anne, like this will not touch you. I will protect you Mm -hmm. to to protect the protector is just a really big deal. Like Mm. that was Anne's job. Anne's job was to protect Jack and Max becomes the protector of Anne. And I feel like this is, you know, we have a clear callback to this of mm-hmm. uh, in, in season four with Adele's speech. Like the yes. idea that that this is another peril that Max and, and Anne have. It's such a quiet parallel. The idea that they both are warriors. They just use very different weapons. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The two weapons which are within the frame of Black Sails directly opposed because Anne is using the methods of the frontier. She's using violence and personal power, whereas Max is using diplomacy and kind of encultured power. She's using society to her advantage and always has. That's always been her superpower is diplomacy, the ability to talk and to build consensus. But the amazing thing is that she's fighting civilization from within, like she tells Jack that she needs to do. So it doesn't mean she's a part of of civilization no, just that she's using she's, its tools against yeah, itself really. right yeah, yeah. Yes, well, and exactly. is in her way representing a purer kind of civilization than the kind of civilization embodied by england oh yeah absolutely and in that way we get another parallel from x which is woods rogers he understands huh. the methods and the rhythms and the structures of civilization but is putting them to very different and right. utterly nefarious use. Right. Whereas Max is, understa- and, uh, Max is understanding those structures and, and systems too, but putting them to much more positive and personal use. Right. Woods Rogers is fundamentally inhuman. Max is fundamentally human. And I think that that opposition is yeah. another very powerful reflection at the wow. heart of Black yeah. Sounds. Yep, absolutely. I and agree. of course, it's no coincidence that the two of them are effectively fighting over Eleanor. That, that yes. is, you know, well, the two of the, them are the effectively heart. the two of them are effectively fighting over Eleanor and Eleanor being the embodiment of NASA. Of NASA yeah. They yeah. are fighting yeah. for the soul of NASA. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Fighting for the soul of NASA. That's very yeah. good. Yeah. So what the other the, the callback I wanted to bring up in in 207 is that when Max talks to Anne after Anne has her break and her metamorphosis mm-hmm. is that she again uses the terminology about life Mm -hmm. she's when she proposes to Anne that they have a coalition that Anne become the person that goes out and makes contacts for max for what she wants to do Mm -hmm. she says especially in this place there is always a life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's always a future as long as we're willing to build it for ourselves yeah so this is showing i think and you could, I mean, there's there's a way you look at the show where you watch Max's relationship to NASA. Mm-hmm. That in the first season, she wants to get away from it, and mm-hmm. then she wants to take over it to prove something to Eleanor. And I feel like almost by accident, Max realizes what NASA has to offer her from the process of trying to prove something to Eleanor. And then in season two, Max is actually seeing NASA as a place of potential, mm-hmm. which is fascinating to me it is particularly by the start of season three when she has ascended to a position of prominence but is nonetheless aware that nasa is treacherous yes right that these, sh- these sands could shift at any moment that's right yeah, yeah. all right well let's that's start talking about season three which i entitled <laughs> that fucking chair <laughs> <laughs> the cost of becoming eleanor sort of and the weight of compromise mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about is that, yes, Max now has essentially become Eleanor. She even says it mm-hmm. eventually once she realizes that part of the cost is to actually betray her friends, even yes. though it wasn't her plan. It happened. It happened and she didn't stop it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's as far as I'm willing to criticize Max in season three. I know there are a lot of people who are willing to criticize her a whole lot more than that. She didn't plot it. She also didn't stop it. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. 
She did lie to Anne. Like, legit, she lied to Anne. That is, as far as I'm concerned, that's her worst sin, was mm-hmm. that she did She did really lie to Anne about John. I think as far as she's concerned, that's her worst sin, too, which yeah. is yep. something, we'll get that, to that in season four, but yeah. that I respect so much about her. I do, too. I do, too. So, yeah, let me quote John again real quickly. I really, really, really like what he said about her was that that there was a point where she was suffocating under the weight of compromises and then she breaks through once she refuses to compromise again. So mm-hmm. season three is the suffocating part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's doing her best. She really, I mean, this this for me in the you know thing I've always been fixated on was that this is the moment where she got the thing that her backstory always told her she wanted, that she mm-hmm. was no longer that little girl looking in on a parlor. Mm-hmm. She's now in the parlor. But she she needed to learn. She had to learn yeah. from the fact that there were pri- there was a price to pay. Mm. And it isn't about necessarily just inside and outside, I suppose, because envisioning that girl eating and dancing and laughing inside the parlor, that's not what Max gets. What Max gets is ownership of the estate. What Max right. gets is responsibility. Right, exactly. oh, and in that point. way, and we talked about this, I think, a long time ago, my first appearance on Fathoms Deep, the degree to which leadership renders you an exile. Mm-hmm. The degree to which oh. the, the captain of a ship Point is it. not a part of the crew of the ship. Yep. And that is very much, I think, what happens to Max in season three. The she crown is heavy. Get, exactly right. Huh. Or the chair is burdensome, uncomfortable. Right. I don't okay, know what right. metaphor we want to use. <laughs> oh. I don't know if I ever brought this up. One of our listeners brought up that Eleanor had a chair with arms on it. Mm -hmm. That back then, like, I didn't think about this. Back, you know how we, you know, there's the whole custom of, like, Mm -hmm. some chairs having arms around a dining room table and some not having arms. Sure. That was so that women with those crazy ass skirts could sit in a chair. Could get in and out. Yeah. Right. Interesting. That an armchair, if you have, if you have basically the outfit of an 18th century woman, there's no way you can sit comfortably or at all, really, in a chair wow. with arms. Huh. And how that made so much sense for Eleanor in the beginning, because she didn't wear that kind of clothing. Mm-hmm. Right. She wore mm-hmm. skirts, but she didn't wear all of the undergarments that made yeah. the skirts really wide. And And Max stays with that chair. And the only way to sit in a chair like that for a woman with the, with the proper attire of that mm-hmm. period, which Max, as we already talked about, was like super, super doing, mm-hmm. is to sit on the edge of your chair. Interesting. Interesting. That you never can sit back. You what never can really metaphor. sit in that chair. You can never be comfortable because you're still right. incompatible with what the chair represents. Yep. That's lovely. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I like that and that's a lot. just the kind of thing that they think about on this show, too. Everybody behind it. Gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Isn't that pretty amazing? Mm-hmm. So I just love that the fucking chair is a chair with arms. It's yeah. a man's chair, basically. Yeah. It's a yeah, chair exactly. that's built for a man. Wow. That's great. Yep. That's a great piece of information. Right. I believe this was Rival Piper. Rival Piper, if this is you, you are, well, <laughs> you are eternally awesome for all of your input. Um, but yes, that chair thing really blew me away. And I'm glad I, it was not my notes. I'm glad I remembered it just now. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's really cool. I wanted to bring up something that I noticed when I was, I was listing the scenes between Max and Silver. And I still don't know what I have come, the conclusion I've come to about them. But there's none in season three. Not at yeah, all. Yeah, that's you. You there said that a moment ago. One wow. scene between Max and Silver in season three. I can list real quickly. <gasps> in season one, there's Blackbeard, and then when they've been found out, and mm-hmm. you know the like guy getting guy getting um, whatever. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Somehow I still have moments where I get a little shy about stuff. Uh huh. Uh, in season two, there is the finding out about Logan, you know, the carnage, mm-hmm. carnage of Logan and Charlotte. And sure. then the crazy, wonderful scene where Silver talks about Flint as if he's godlike and then mm-hmm. tells her about, you know, and basically they come up with their gold, the gold proposition. Mm-hmm. Season three, there is nothing. Wow. Yes. I mean, that makes a lot of sense when you think about where the plot is in season three, but surprising nonetheless. We will talk about this when we talk about mythology and and Black Sails. I know mm-hmm. that you love to talk about season four being the season where Black Sails goes super mythic. Mm-hmm. I think that season three is that. Like for oh, me, sure. actually, season yeah. three yeah. is the most mythic. Is the most Interesting. Mythic. The most oh. mythic. Okay. Yep. In a lot of ways, I think season three is the most mythic okay. part of Black Sails. Not in a Treasure Island sort of way, but just in mm-hmm. a like... There's just a whole lot of 
of that for the Treasure Island characters where they're yeah. just arguably not 100% in our world anymore. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and Max is. So that makes a lot of sense for me that that she and Silver do not cross paths because mm-hmm. the Treasure Island characters don't spend a lot of time in NASA. They're almost not in yeah, NASA no, that's true. Yeah, for all yeah. of season three. Mm-hmm. And she is, if you know, possibly more than any other time embodying NASA in season three. Do you all have any thoughts about that beyond what I just said about Mythic? And I just it just really struck me when I was making this list. I was like, really? And I thought about it and I was like, nope. So in season three, we see Max step back from the frontier pirate world more fully into the arms of civilization, whatever that right. represents. We see her allying herself with Woods Rogers. We see her giving up her share of the Spanish gold in order to secure her place on the Council of NASA, right. trying to, nice. to buy herself privilege, which is exactly what she says to Anne right at the beginning of the season. If we have right. that gold, it doesn't matter who comes here. It can be England, it can be Spain, and we can give them the gold and say, leave us in peace. And right. that is... Kind of what she does, but not really, because she doesn't give Woods Rogers the gold and say, okay, now you leave me alone. She buys influence instead. She is enfranchising herself in the the operation of NASA, and we see her stepping back from Anne toward Eleanor. Does that speak to you both about her arc there? Does that speak to you about who Max is at this point? Is she making a meaningful change or is this an extension of what we've seen from her through the season today? Oh, well, I just want to argue about the stepping back from Anne. Mm -hmm. I mean, she does step back from Anne. I mean, she breaks up with Anne, Mm -hmm. obviously. Um, For me, the the breaking up with Anne is a, is a moment of grace. Like Mm -hmm. I think that she, that's where the, that's where the phrase uh, beyond choice comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, she understands it's, it's her ability to understand people, her understanding that, that Anne could never go down this road with her and that she cannot go down a different road at this phase. I mean, mm-hmm. she does move beyond that, thank goodness, and I'm so proud of her and I love her. <laughs> but but at this point in their lives, Max sees what she's doing is beyond choice because she's fulfilling the thing that her childhood has dictated she needs in her mind. Mm. And she knows that Anne can't go down that road with her, that Anne's mm-hmm. too pure, that Anne will have to be a pirate, will have to, in your in your wording, Alistair, that Anne can't be separated from the concept of the frontier. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why she separates from Anne. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with that. But in the first season, Max is absolutely ready to leave NASA. She's ready to leave NASA with nothing but the clothes on her back. She doesn't care. She wants the life. She wants out of this place. But then to spend the Spanish gold that she could wield in the securing of a life elsewhere, buying a, a kind of state of privilege, buying a kind of political power in NASA, that I, I'm never sure what to make of that well, decision. Well, see, I still disagree with you about why she's leaving NASA. Mm-hmm. Again, you go back to my theory that you know, in my eyes, everything she does in season one is in relation to Eleanor. The only sure. reason she wants to leave is because she needs to leave Eleanor. She wanted her original mm. plan was to was to to get the money from this deal mm-hmm. for herself and Eleanor. Sure, sure. So is it not then fair to say that during season three, she turns back to Eleanor? She, I mean, they literally turn back oh, toward each other. They literally yeah, yeah. find a, Again, a measure of solace and, and right. companionship in each other. Yeah. I mean, I guess, yes, she does turn back towards Eleanor. I don't think she ever looked away from Eleanor mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that everything she ever did was in relation to Eleanor. Um, Interesting. And we see that. In, I mean, that's why in season four, we so needed that conversation mm-hmm. between them. Like she still needed to hear from Eleanor why Eleanor couldn't couldn't do that with her. Why, so, why she why she wasn't enough. Sure. Why, so much like vain, Eleanor, even in absence, dictates the course of your life, dictates the, yeah. the, the choices well, that you make. E- even the fight she had with Jack. Mm-hmm. in 406 when she says sure, what she sure. needs to do when she says we need to go to philadelphia part of that was because woods rogers killed her yeah yeah interesting that she died that Anne almost died again she's always yeah it's these are the two things that always are meaningful for her the reason she needs to do this is because eleanor died and Anne almost died i guess what i'm trying to unpick is to what extent max has an awareness of and a loyalty to nasa as a concept Mm -hmm. And to what extent Max is personally loyal to Eleanor, who happens to be partially an embodiment of NASA. 
Yeah, I think the Nassau part grows. I mean, I do right. think, and that's yeah, what I brought right. up, and that's why I brought up the 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 concept of a life. Sure. Being in the in season one, the concept of a life is about Eleanor. Mm -hmm. In season two, the concept of a life is because of the opportunities that Nassau offers. Yes. In season three, I would posit that she actually gives up the idea of a life for the sake of this other thing that's always been compelling her. This right. this this trauma from her childhood. And so in, in season three, she gives up the idea of a life altogether. And in mm -hmm. season four, she understands really what having a life right. means. Because yeah. great people don't get lives. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Would the greatest victory for Max have been to continue running the brothel? To have just been, you know, a business owner, to have just been employed mm -hmm. gainfully under the, the authority, I suppose, the nominal authority of Jack Rackham? Would that have been a good and fulfilling life for her? Would have been an okay life. I mean, I think that Max actually does. I agree with Liz in the roundtable. I think Max is the person who, who most reaches her best self. I think mm -hmm. that Max mm -hmm. needed to go through the process she went. She needed to meet Grandma Guthrie and have yes. Grandma Guthrie offer her everything, mm -hmm. and for her to say, "You know what? I've done compromising," mm -hmm. and yeah. then get yeah. what she needs. Yeah. yeah, like to actually stop compromising and then get what she needs after That's that. Exactly. It. When I was m talking earlier about uh, rationalism being somewhat unlovely within mm -hmm. the frame of black sales, it's exactly that. It's the necessity of compromise that accompanies rationalism and pragmatism. That is what we don't love. We don't object to rational action on its own. We do object to the compromise of the ideal. That is why we look to people like Silver and Flint and even Billy to a certain extent. We can respect that driving fury that defines him, even if we wish that he would just stop and sit down and have some chocolate milk and maybe take a nap. Because I think you're hangry, <laughs> Billy, I think is the problem. I think you're just a little sleepy and a little mad. Well, we his respect. eyes really messed up by the yeah, end. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we respect idealism and we, we are dubious of compromise. And I think you're absolutely right. That transition, I hadn't thought of it in quite those terms, but yes, Max coming to the, the understanding that compromise is, is less than virtuous. I think that really speaks to me about her arc in season four. Yeah. It's similar to, what does she say uh, about making a choice that she wouldn't have to live with that, like the choice or, or right. something like that. I know that you know it, Daphne. <laughs> right. So this goes, this goes back to the thing I said before about, I mean, this I love I, that again, that she's the only character that has refused to allow violence to be the answer to an unsolvable mm -hmm. question is then when Silver says, why didn't you kill me? So in four, four, That's it. 402, yeah. they meet up mm -hmm. and, and she's going to, she said, this has to end. And for this to end, you need to end, but she doesn't mean kill him. Yeah. She mm -hmm. means take him to that plantation. Right. Um, exactly. And, yes. and um, which we didn't know yet. But then, right. Then he says, why, why didn't you kill me? And she says that killing you would solve some problems, but it would cause others that I choose not to live with. And he said, what problems are those? And she says that I would have to live with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's exactly it. Yeah. You're right. And this mirrors the, in the episode right before that or two episodes before that. Anne said essentially the same thing about Max, mm -hmm. that she didn't want to be sent to Ma Nassau because if she was sent to Nassau, she would feel compelled to hurt Max and that she didn't want yes. to live with that. Yes. I remember that too. Mm. That's all very good. Right. Oh, I love these writers. So, I mean, this, is, I know, I mean, season four, I mean, maybe we can move on to season four. Season four is where Max's, Max's parallels with every, not just every character, but what we respect about each mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. becomes text. Like yeah. is you, you know, is just very clear with reusing of words. Um, part of what she says in that library about slavery could have come from like mm -hmm. from the letter that Vane left on Richard Guthrie's body for, for Eleanor that he mm -hmm. says like, I was a slave. I will be in no, a slave no longer. And thus I will, and then thus I free Nassau. Like I won't let Nassau be enslaved. Mm. It's just, Max is just, and again, the question is ultimately, where does Max intersect with Flint then? Like John said, he's like, okay, well, Flint's a person, you know, raising his fist against civilization and Max kind of is too. But again, it's so interesting. So if that's their, if that's where they parallel then really the question is whether we do this from outside or from inside. Exactly. I think that's the direct opposition between Max and Flint. If Flint had been 
well, I don't want to say smarter. If Flint had been more political and less mm-hmm. militaristic, mm-hmm. then he would have taken an approach very much like Max's to embody the trappings of civilization and to subvert from within rather than opposing from without. Although, even as I say that, I'm not sure that's true because I don't think that's pure enough for Flint. Because Flint right. doesn't just want yeah. the actuality of opposition, he wants the theatricality of opposition. He wants to make a statement and say, no, you are going to be brought down and you are going to know exactly why and by whom. And Max doesn't care about yeah. flying the flag. She doesn't care about bearing the standard. So do you think that comes down then to the whole concept of knowing no shame? I mean, Max has been downtrodden. Max has every quality of of things that civilization puts people down for, that mm-hmm. she that she is, mm-hmm. that she was enslaved. She's a person of color. Mm-hmm. She's also gay. Like all of the things basically that all of our characters that have been persecuted by civilization, she has every single trait of those characters. Mm-hmm. But I believe she doesn't have shame. I was just thinking that. Like, I can't think. I, I remember that awful, awful guy who, yeah, you know who I'm talking about, the guy in the chair on the beach at dark. Mm-hmm. The awful guy that they were trading for the pearls. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, 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 yes. Gross. And how her response was so dignified. And uh, and there was there was no hint or trace of sudden shame. I've never seen a desire in Max to cover up. Yeah. There's cover degree, up or prove herself. She doesn't yeah. she doesn't hide her backstory like silver. It's true. And she doesn't feel the need to prove herself like Flint. So yes. might she be in a story that is explicitly about knowing no shame, mm-hmm. where that is talked about quite a bit, could this n- be another place where Max is secretly solving the problem without us even noticing she's doing it? What do you mean by solving the problem? Do we have this problem of shame? Like, this is a really big deal in this show. So the problem is just don't feel it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, no, I think that do, there's something... Well, no, that's what I'm saying is, do we have a character that that was quietly exemplifying what, what how one can, can navigate this mm. world without shame? I think there is a degree, and I've said this before on Fathom's Deep, I think there's a degree to which we must fear integration that all of the characters in Black Sails are internal dichotomies. They are torn right. between two poles within themselves. That's true of Silver, it's true of Flint, it's true of just everyone. And shame, in part, lives in that space between those two poles. It lives in that tension between who you are and who you present yourself to be. Mm-hmm. And for oh, Max, well, from the That's very beginning of the show, and if not right from the beginning, certainly through the crucible of the tent on the beach... Max has no space, no tension between what she is and what she is presented Mm -hmm. as. There is literally no space for shame in Max's life because there's no secret there. There's nothing that she has or is capable of withholding. Now, that could have been an approach that we took when we got to Philadelphia, but we don't because by that point she is strong enough that she can stand in her truth. Right, right. And even when she's doing theater... Mm-hmm. Which I do believe she does. I mean, we've talked yeah. about this already in this oh, episode. She wields it like a weapon, yes. <laughs> exactly. She wields it like a weapon because these are the types of weapons, mm-hmm. you know, like when we have a knife, we cut bread with it. We don't stab people. Yeah. Uh-huh. When Max is given a given theater as a weapon, she uses it to strengthen herself and those around her, but she mm-hmm. doesn't use it. She doesn't weaponize it. She doesn't use it in a way to hurt others. Yeah. She uses it to pull herself and the and the, those around her up. Right. Unlike Eleanor Guthrie, who at several points in the unfolding story uses exactly the same skill and exactly the same position in society within Nassau to, to directly attack. I'm thinking mm-hmm. in particular of, of course, the Max-related scene on the beach when she calls out Vane's crew and said, that's it. You all join Flint's crew or none of you will ever trade here again. Max would never do that. Instead, she'll get Adele to seduce Featherstone and bring over 28 men to Jack's side. Exactly. Exactly. Which, you know, a situation that's, again, like you quoted in the beginning, like this is, you know, pleasure should be shared equally. It's the only way to avoid hurt feelings. Again, who was hurt there? Like yeah, Featherstone, yeah. sure, he was duped a little bit, but, you know, well, all in all, hurt, this worked out pretty I mean, well for yeah. Yeah. It worked right. out pretty exactly. well for Featherstone. I don't think exactly. he's got any complaints right now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, has a little trouble walking, but he's doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did. She did stick something in his bum. I don't remember what she said. She was like and that I'll, that tongue, I'll tell I me believe, everything. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
Lisa and Craig, if you're listening, we adore you. We um, love you. Yep. <laughs> so again, I just, uh, I find all of this super, super interesting. And the last thing I wanted to, yeah, well, I guess this, we kind of maybe have now just covered this. Like Alistair, you brought up in the first time you came on Fathers Deep, the idea that people, when they reach their apotheosis, they that leads to their death. I mean, again, I think Black Sails kind of proved proved both of us wrong on that one because I feel like Anne managed to do that and didn't die. No, but she did, is the thing. Anne did metaphorically die. Mm. Flint did metaphorically okay, die. We're not enough. literally killing these people, but we right. are, in a sense, ending them. Right. We are certainly no, no, you're ending totally right. that, that version totally right. of them. Vane, of course, being the most powerful example of a character who, who reaches that internal unity, right. resolves that inner dichotomy, and then immediately dies because right. there's just no space for that in, right. in this narrative. So, so then, but then we have, okay, then we have Jack who doesn't. Jack doesn't, I, right? Right. Because I don't think he ever reaches it. Because nope, he never had the, Jack is still looking at the horizon, right, still looking at the flag, just, still thinking about the legend. Being, he's just <laughs> being Jack. Like, yes. I yep. don't think Jack actually, I yeah. love Jack doesn't really grow that <laughs> does <laughs> but that does is kind his... of confirm for us that that inner dichotomy isn't necessarily a bad thing that it can legitimately drive man to greatness that, that people well, can be better than although, they are well though we do see him pretty pretty drunkenly blabbering on to sure but then when he's <laughs> to back Mary on the Reed ship at the end yeah he is. Mark Reed is. Yes. Yeah. he is okay well, jack's a special case but max i think if anything totally does it yeah I I would agree. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that she does. Like when she says no to Marion Guthrie and she turns towards Anne, yeah. she in the opposite. She doesn't die when she reaches it. She is rewarded with all of the rewards in the world. Exactly. Mm. And I think that's that's very significant and is one of the ways in which Max very quietly guides us through this story and and, and is a landmark by which we can navigate this story. I think that's that's extremely powerful. And she really does stand apart in that because none of our other characters, even fairly peripheral characters, get that kind of resolution, get that kind of integration. Yep. It really belongs to Max and Max alone. You can argue that even Eleanor reaches a kind of integration, which I would argue is a false integration. I don't, as I've said before, I don't like right. the Eleanor Woods Rogers story, but that's yeah. fine. But she reaches something approaching a point of integration and is immediately killed for it. This, this ripples out through the story, except for Max, who is pretty much integrated from the jump. She is pretty much there from the beginning of the story. Well, but then she becomes an even better version of herself. Oh, sure. No, absolutely. I mean, I think she yeah. grows a lot. And I think that season four, that that mm. speech with Anne, like that was the moment where she's like, I am now perfect. I was pretty yeah. close to perfect already. <laughs> <laughs> and now I am in fact perfect. But now, dig me. Well, and, and that's what gave her the power to be back in that library mm. with, with Grandma Guthrie and yeah. say, hey, dude, I like you. You asked for all these things. I can't give you a single one of those things, mm -hmm. but here's my counter offer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone as savvy as Marion Guthrie says, cool. Because Max still can read the room. Yeah. Still yep. knows what people yep. want and yep. knows how to give it to them. And again, forges a solution based in compromise. Right. That's perhaps the most interesting thing about the very end of the show and Jack's little epilogue that we get as he's talking to Mary Reed right there at the end is that he is describing Max's perfect world. Yeah. That there's still piracy, but there's also commerce. There's civilization, but there's also the frontier. Yep. The, all of NASA. Max throughout has failed to persuadingly articulate an argument for NASA in the way that Flint or Vane or Silver or yeah. you know Billy have tried to do. And yet it's Max's vision that comes to fruition, which happens yep. also, of course, to be Jack's vision because he still gets to be the boy adventurer pirate out there <laughs> on the horizon. Right. Oh, that's Again. Sad. Still buckling his swash left and right. Again, yet again, Jack getting the stuff because he was just smart enough exactly to understand right. that Max is the person to follow. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah. As much as he resented it, he did know. Yep. Yep. Well, and again, I think by the end, he's not resenting it at all. I think yeah. No, I think it. you're right. By the end. Yeah. Although, I mean, it was e even on board when they first got into Philadelphia, he was still. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was the very end but, where he was yeah. finally. Well, no, right. I, I don't know, because were. he's still in that moment when he does the brilliant French accent telling Max that yeah. he's not going to bring her because yeah. she will. If this goes south, she will immediately turn him over to the guard and that will right. be yep. it. I love even then he knows her. He respects her. This is a savvy and rational move from him because he's right. 
He yep. knows that she's not going to sell herself out to principle. She's going to do whatever pragmatic thing she has to do to ensure her own survival. Yeah. He allows her to come when he has no alternative left, Although, when he believes that this is the right thing. Right. Although, like Anne needed that speech from Adele, I think that he needed that mm-hmm. little mini speech from Featherstone where he says yes. that right. she never betrayed anyone who didn't betray her before that, present company included. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I guess technically. Technically? Do, well, do we think that's completely true? I mean, did she ever betray anyone? Well, no, she didn't betray, but she did oh. set in motion schemes that have oh, had yes. unfortunate okay. consequences for sure, people sure, about sure. whom she does not give okay. a damn. We could have, I guess, amended what Featherstone t- said to Max didn't seemingly betray anyone <laughs> okay, <laughs> betray <laughs> before that. Well, no, again, like, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, she did not... You know, Jack betrayed himself when he mm-hmm. came back to town to clear his name. And, you know, we, we've had that discussion already yeah, about yeah. why he did that. Um, and Max thought that she was finding a compromise yeah. with Woods Rogers. They weren't supposed to send Jack to Spain. They were supposed to just get the cash from yeah. Jack and Anne, which would have sucked for them. They would have been super mad at Max yeah. no matter what. Yes. But the only when he was already in prison did the did the terms change to mm-hmm. being... Oh wait, Spain wants him too, and they want to hang him. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. Hmm. Again, she didn't stand in the way of that. She got you know a little ballsier by season four when she was when she when and that was the other betrayal. Was although I don't think she sees that a betrayal, but they the pirates all see it as betrayal. The mm-hmm. fact that she intercepted Featherstone's message about yes the the whole sunken ship yeah, war yeah. plan that right. Again, uh, you know, that's definitely a who betrayed who first kind of situation Mm -hmm. because she was trying to make peace and they were trying to make war. They were definitely disagreeing with each other over what is the solution at this point. (laughs) I want to ask you both what happens to Max after the show is done. What does Max's (laughs) life look like? A year after the Rackham epilogue, what happens to Max five years after, ten years after? Do you have a sense of the the shape of her story in the years after Black Sails? Are we including historical knowledge? I was going to say because <laughs> I don't know historically, right. so well, I can just no. I, I, think, I, I know yeah, that Jack we, Rackham deviated dies, enough from and history. Bonnie basically doesn't, right? No, Bonnie, Bonnie they don't know. Bonnie gets away. Yeah. Bonnie gets don't away. Know. Jack is hung. Okay, yeah. So my head cannon. Is, um, yeah, she and Featherstone and Adele are always good buddies in the drawing room and and having a good time. And uh, she, for the most part, leads a powerful but quiet uh, life, I Mm -hmm. suppose. And um, she's the power behind the throne. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think that when I think that whenever Anne is not on the sea is not out pirating then she is with max and i think that after we lose jack rackham that can max and Anne live happily ever after more or less that would be okay for me although i've never shipped them i oops did i say that like <laughs> super clearly i think that i've said it everybody gets it but yeah no they're not my favorite but it's fine but i would like for a general kind of happy ever after for max i don't know how long nassau even is able to Right. I mean, I know that, you know, historically, Woods Rogers does come back and is yeah. governor of Nassau again. <laughs> which, ah, which I don't, I don't want that. for this Woods Rogers. No, uh, so yeah, that's a hard not. one. That sounds real bad. Yes, I, I, I do ship Max and Ann and I do want them to. I want. But, you know, it's just like Max maybe needs some amount of power and and, you know, like we talked about with Toby, and does seem to really, really, really love killing people. So, like, yeah. are we are we going full on like realistic? Or are we doing like the choose your own adventure version where I get I to just say anything? The choose your own adventure. I think we yeah. have a strong enough sense okay. of Black Sails canon and the ways in which it deviates okay. both from the the canonicity of Treasure Island and okay. actual historical fact. Yeah. Okay, choose your own adventure version is that that when Woods Rogers comes back. I'm going to assume that like that more or less coincides with my dear Jack being hung mm-hmm. is that yeah. uh, Featherstone and Adele go live a quiet life in the interior mm-hmm. and Max and Anne move to Brussels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. What, they did act, I don't remember which, which places like, no, Anne did with Jack. I think that it was cave, Brussels. Bring up like, saying, Brussels. <laughs> they moved to Brussels. Yeah. Where, where like, 
they become like kind of a hitman company where mm-hmm. Max is the one that negotiates the deals and Whoa. Anne is the one that does the killing. Whoa. And, would watch. <laughs> and okay, you took that way further than I thought you were going to take it. Like, I am super into it. When they're not doing that, they're like drinking champagne and eating mussels. This is my new favorite yeah. show yeah. and it yeah. doesn't yeah. even exist. <laughs> John, I mean, John, you're Jack listening to, to this, right? John, so if <laughs> I can this. totally just, if I can just change history, then Jack's like with them and he's like oh, wow. designing banners for people while the other two are doing their hitman business. So <laughs> that's really what I want. But, you know, so it depends how much I have to stay within the parameters of history. But right. really, I want Janix in Brussels doing business and designing banners and awesome. champagne and mussels. Awesome. When not I'm killing people. So surprisingly into that. <laughs> okay. All right, Alistair, what's your version? <sighs> My version. Um, I think I think I agree with Elizabeth that Max finds a piece that comes from being the power behind the throne, not in a showy way, not in an ostentatious or opulent way, but she finds peace and security, which is security. really what she's been looking at. This is her preoccupation mm-hmm. with sand right. throughout. Is that sand, yep. is, sand is shifting, sand is fluid, mm-hmm. sand can, can move and betray you. And now I want to see Max, as we apparently do in a NASA that is on bedrock, that yep. is firm, and that she gets to simply live and gets to mm-hmm. build something not out of necessity and not out of desperation but she gets to to wield the power of civilization in the crafting of something that will within the mythical fictional realm of black sails endure i love the thought that that anne now has actually found a peaceful way of resolving the inner dichotomy that has plagued her mm-hmm. she is max's when they're on land and mm-hmm. she is Jack's when they're at sea. Oh, I love that. And that, that is 100% true. And that is 100% her. I do like and that. everyone has found their their place, has found right. their belonging. I also believe, I believe that Max will tell stories. I believe that Max will unify this community and, and, and tighten this culture by telling something that is very close to the story that we get in Black Sails. And I wanted to bring this up to you, Daphne, because we've talked about Max being the protagonist or not being the protagonist of Black Sails. To what degree do you think it is possible that Max is the narrator of Black Sails? Hmm. That Max is the authorial voice? Certainly, John identifies yeah. closely with Max. He, he clearly has, just, just listening to the podcasts, clearly has a great affection for Max and her perspective. To what degree does the story of Black Sails resemble the story of NASA as told by Max? Uh, can you be the narrator if you're not the storyteller? That's so interesting. Mm. I think you can tell stories about storytellers. John is doing that right now with right. Black Sails. He's telling the story of Jack Rackham, uh-huh. who is himself the storyteller, or Billy, who is the storyteller, right. or Silver, or Flint. Oh, that's so interesting. Again, I find her, I, I think I like her best as the axis around which everything moves and mm-hmm. Jack as the storyteller. Sure. Yeah. And sure. I like, I think, didn't, didn't John say that? Like that Jack in a way is the, is the person witnessing Max's story, mm-hmm. that he's oh, like the chorus to her story. explicit in the text in that, that yeah. final Rackham epilogue. Yeah. We get, yeah, we, we get a very clear encapsulation of the narrative voice of Black Sails there with Jack actually yes. telling the story right. and looking upward to Featherstone Again, and Adele uh, and Max. Maybe I do want to say that she's the protagonist, like maybe Flint and Silver and all of that is really just the thorn in her side. And this was really her... I think. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, uh-huh. kind of, yeah. There's yeah. a version of that story, absolutely. Yeah. We right. could distill out the Max story here, yeah. That if you... Right, mm. well, and like he said, and like we said before he said, is that you can choose to see this story. Like Lauren said, you can choose to yeah. see this story from many people's perspectives. Yeah. But, yeah. but there is a really compelling argument for this is the story of Max taking a world that was divided... And in a cycle mm. that no one could find their way out of, yes. and that her job was that that this is the story of Max learn getting powerful enough to mm. understand that she's the person who could drown the cat. Ah, mm. mm-hmm. oh, that's very good. That notion of cycles I find really interesting because thinking about Black Sails now, I want to go back and watch it and pay attention to all of the references contained within the text to yep. the previous generation to mm-hmm. hands and teach and the great pirates of the days of yore, to, to the golden age of piracy as it's perceived by the people in NASA, and to get a better sense of what the cycle is. Because we get this idea that 
that this is what happens, that the frontier is established and civilization comes in and we never win. The pirates are always pushed further and further mm-hmm. and further and right. that the world is constantly diminishing. But there must have been a time when that wasn't true. Mm-hmm. You know, there must have been a time when the first pirates arrived at NASA and it became right. Well, they ascendant. do talk about that quite a bit. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I want yeah. to go back and, and track all of that to get a better sense of Black Sails and its story as a part of a broader, well, you know, historical con- or a quasi historical context. Well, and that's also, I mean, we can talk about this when we talk about mythology yeah. later in a in a soon to be episode because that is the mythology within the story. Yeah. Exactly. That is the mythology by which they're living their lives is the mythology of proper pirates. Yeah. Yeah. This has been so much fun. I <laughs> I I hope Max Dear fictional person that that I adore, I hope that we did you justice because we do love you. Um, and um, yeah, this is yeah, this has been great. I feel like I feel like we did do her some justice, and I feel like I will keep watching the show and learn new things about her because I certainly mm-hmm. managed to learn a yeah. whole lot in the time that I was preparing for this episode, <laughs> despite <laughs> so much watching. I'm sure. Yeah. And I can't wait to go back and and just start from the beginning and watch this whole show again, because I think that it's going to be completely different on the second go around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it is. Right. And Alistair, you've only really watched through once, right? Uh, More or less once. Yes. I've watched every individual episode a few times, but in terms of enjoying the narrative right from the beginning, yeah, I I am eager now for a rewatch of Black Sails. Mm -hmm. I'm still holding out on this box set. I still want like the final complete box set edition. (laughs) I don't know if that thing is ever going to exist, but in the meantime, I have the Stars app and that's fine. (laughs) And American Gods finishes this week, so I'll have lots of time on my hands. That's right. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening here as we're getting towards the tail end of what's been such a wonderful and joyous ride. Um, Until next time, from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive. And I'm Alistair Stevens. Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening.